This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. King Arthur just buckled on his knee cop. Now the quishes, the falls, and observes himself in his brilliantly polished shield. The new leg armor he has just put on is a fine fit. Provides maximum maneuverability. Now the chest armor. Breastplate. Neck piece. He tucks helmet under his arm, picks up Excalibur his sword, and walks from his tent into the sunlight. King Arthur is going into a battle against a friend of his. 4,000 men will be killed over a woman, which is known as chivalry. Tonight, my report to you on The Triangle on the Round Table. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. century Britain, a time of mists and legend, of hunting horn and streaming banners and maidens and thistle, of sunlight slanting like a tapestry into cold castles, and pagan rites and magic and stone. And the place that concerns us, Camelot, the court of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. There's just been a meeting on the agenda, a report from Launcelot why he failed in his quest for the Holy Grail. A report by Sir Galahad on why he'd killed a scurvy knave, a reason being a look askance at Lady Vivian. And finally, a suggestion by Sir Percival that a party be sent to slay the seven wicked knights at the Castle of Maidens. It was a fine meeting, and it was breaking up in time for some mock jousting. King Arthur was anxious to get out on the field. The king, uh, King Arthur, Terry, I would speak with you a moment. Agravain, nephew. What is it? Uh, but a moment, tarry, uncle, till the rest of the gentle knights are gone from the great hall. Sir Lionel, would you close, please, the great door when you leave us? Now, uncle. <laughs> but your cousin Mordred is still with us. I think he slept at the round table and is sleeping still. Mordred. <laughs> Wake. Wake, gentle knight. Wake, wake. Mordred and I both wish to speak, Uncle. Uh, of what? Are you awake, Mordred? I was awakened by the touch of the sweet king. Speak to me of what, Agravin? Of Launcelot. Oh? And Guinevere. What is this? Since he is back from the failure, since he has returned without the grail... Launcelot is much with the queen in the queen's chamber. What falsehood is this? No falsehood, good king. Gentle king. The truth that I'll swear on the hilt of my sword. And I also. But Guinevere the queen is with me constantly. Save when you hunt. Save when you joust. Save when you do the merry pie with us all. Yes. That is when Launcelot attends your queen. When you hunt. When you joust. When you do the merry pie with us all. And king. What is it? If Lancelot be slain in the chambers of the queen, what then? A province to the south I'll give to such a slayer. Good uncle. Sweet king. Ah! 
And now to you, Mordred. Hold, hold, hold. Good night. Put up your sword. Yes, to your throat, thus. Do not slay me. What a sniveller you are, cousin. Do not kill me. To sneak like a crawling thing and spy. I, I, I have forgotten what I have seen. You and Guinevere. Say my lady's name again, and your tongue will be fed to my lady's goldfish. Now get from here. Go! Mordred didn't walk away, nor did he skip. He ran. He told the king that in case Sir Agravaine wasn't around anymore, that worthy could be found dead in Guinevere's anteroom from a sword blow delivered by Lancelot. King Arthur, who'd had a bad day at the mock joust anyhow, having been unseated by Lucky Lance Thrust, well, this is all he needed. Oh, my queen. What poisonous thing has bited you? You'll die for it. Roast. Gawain! Sir Gawain, come to me! And hark to me, Sir Gawain. I hark. It's Guinevere. Again. Hark to me. With Sir Launcelot. Hark to me, Gawain. The whole court knows it. Now you know it. And you wish her burned at the stake, as it has been three times before. But you will forgive her. Hark to me. But you will forgive her. Not this time. You say that always. I will feed her to the flames. And Launcelot... He is my dearest knight. How can you save us? He is dear friend to me. But he and Guinevere... She is so beauteous that he cannot help it. I counsel you to burn him also. This is your counsel, noble knight. It is. Then it shall be done. So to it. When Lancelot heard the news, he didn't wait for a thing. He left. He didn't even say goodbye to Guinevere. Not that he didn't love her, for this he did dearly. But he had a more spectacular plan. He waited for the day when Guinevere was shriven and tied to the stake, and the faggots were thrown and lit. And King Arthur's knights and the people were standing on tiptoes to watch. Then Lancelot and his men went into action. They did a very dramatic thing. Just as a wisp of flame had touched Guinevere's linen, they swooped down and rescued her, killed some 50 people in the process, and rode away with her. Rode away with her. She up front with Lancelot on his horse. Lancelot, Lancelot. And with him set up house in Lancelot's castle, which was called the Joyous Bastion, after the good times which were had there. Lancelot. Launcelot. My queen. Not your queen, your love. Forever. For always. For as long as yon orb of sun climbs in the sky and... Launcelot. My love. My love. Tarry, tarry, sweet knight. And give look to where I point. To where yon orb of sun climbs in the sky. Horsemen. Knights. King Arthur's knights of the round table. I chill at the sight. I chill not. Nothing will befall you. Never will the king take you from me. And a little while after that... War, siege, clang of armor, yell of battle, and scream of alarm. Many knights died, and many were wounded and borne away. And after a month, the papal bull was issued, which said that the war between Arthur and Lancelot was a war of brothers, and it was to cease. And Guinevere was to be brought again into the favor of Arthur... Lancelot went back to France, Guinevere went back to Arthur, and everybody was happy. Until one day... If I offend, O King, by being not announced, but burst upon you like some squall of wind, it is because I've had a dream, and in it... O King, O King... Rise up, Mordred. Speak you. And in this dream, a mighty voice... Lancelot sits in France, said the voice. 
And makes plans to come here and make battle and win again the Lady Guinevere. What voice has told you this? The voice of my father. And so wise your father and sweet. Ere he died a mystic death on the stoop of Lady Bernice. Sweet father. And he said, tell your king... Tell the noble King Arthur to get him to France with all his noble knights and make pursuit of Lancelot. Seek him? Feared him? Slay him. He has said this. Nodding his head, he said it. Uh, go in. Come to me, go in. You have heard what says Mordred, go in. I heard. What say you? I... My say... father wept when he told me what he did. Wept for the death of your two boys, Gawain, who fell in battle against Lancelot. Your father, compassionate man. What say you? But stalwart sons who can never be again, the boy. I say go. Oh, brutal day. At once. I say go. Oh, day of blood. To France. Let there be war. Let the killing start. To France! To war! Sir Mordred was a bloodthirsty one, wasn't he? But he didn't get to go to France. Somehow he made King Arthur make him stay home to watch Camelot, to watch Britain... To watch Queen Guinevere. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. A too-much-traveled traveling man, a wife who is not what she seems, and a meek husband are the leading characters of this Friday's Broadway's My Beat mystery. They lead Detective Danny Clover quite a chase before he makes sense out of murder. Friday evening on most of these same CBS radio stations. And now once again, Thomas Hyland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on the triangle on the round table. Camelot, which was the site of King Arthur's court and round table, has been variously located at Queen's Camel, a Somerset. 51 miles east-northeast of Rochester, and at Winchester and Camelford, Cornwall, and at Carleon. In your Sunday supplement recently, you might have seen where Sir Malcolm Jedifer, FRCA, has tossed a blockbuster by announcing Camelot's location as being 20 miles out at sea, on land now sunk beneath the waves. But, wherever it was, Camelot was the place to be if you wanted to become a knight. It was best to start at about the age of seven. There was so much to learn. Manners, morals, battle axe technique, mace wielding, emergency armor repair, lance throwing, jousting, mock and for real, rescuesmanship, horsemanship. Mostly you had to be a killer. One graduate of the curriculum who went through it like a whiz, skipping as it were the course in advanced morals, was named Mordred. His king was away at war. His queen was in her chambers. And he was at his desk, putting quill to parchment, writing up a pronouncement to the people. Uh, this should do, Sir Bohood. Here, read it. To the Parliament and people of Britain, words as, as you, you would proclaim it, Bohood, being received this dolorous day that has fallen in battle King Arthur, most illustrious and bravest of kings. Is true, Mordred? Go on. Even as Sir Gawain died in battle, bravely and... It is true about Gawain, surely. For his body dead was carried here to Camelot to be buried. But the king, King Arthur... Put your tongue to what is writ. 
Bravely oh. and with no fear of dying. Therefore, I, Mordred, do proclaim myself king and regent of Britain, as was the wish of the fallen Arthur. I do humbly pray that the knights and good people of the realm help make my reign a blessed one. I get you to your task. Proclaim it. Yes. Yes? Yes, O noble king. Noble knight. Yes. Have you seen the gentle Guinevere? When last I saw her, she was moving toward her chamber. How moving? With milk. With grace, with queenly demeanor, go, go proclaim, sweet Bohort, noble king. Fright you, Guinevere? What man are you to come on bed here? I am your king. King? What? Arthur is dead. You will hear it proclaimed. Oh, do you have this knowledge that Arthur is dead? No ship from France has come with tidings of battle in a fortnight. I dreamed it. My father in a dream has told me. You make good use of your father's ghost, cousin. He is noble. Your dead husband, Arthur, has always said that. And as a ghost, my father is more noble and more wise. Mordred. Yes? You are a subtle beast. <laughs> I sheathe my claws for you, dear Guinevere. Dearest Guinevere. No. Dearest Guinevere. Near me now and with this golden knife. I'll... Oh, who is the beast, Guinevere? I will. I'll stick you. <laughs> I'll strive to kill you for honor's sake. <laughs> you. You beast of golden claw, you... Now, we all know that Mordred was not mortally hurt, nor was he even badly hurt. He healed nicely and quickly enough to pursue Guinevere, who had taken refuge in the Tower of London. Mordred caused arrows to be shot at the Tower battlements. He caused pots of molten flame to be catapulted into the steps. He caused stout oaken battering rams to be plunged against its doors. He caused all sorts of things to be done according to his personal code of how to behave in love. But, as we all know, too, the Tower of London was built to last, and he never got past the first moat. As a matter of fact, he was a little bit on this side of the first moat when Sir Bohort, the proclaimer, came running up to him. <laughs> and when Bohort ran, something was wrong. Something wrong, O King. What? At Dover. At Dover, a grievous sight. What? The fleets of King Arthur. And what? The tallest ship flies his banner. He is alive. A curse to my father. The ghost of your father lied. Arthur is alive. The ghost of my father plays tricks. What will you do? Proclaim to my knights that Arthur comes again. So more battle. Blood. Blood, more blood. The life of sweet knighthood. Oh, would it were. Silence. Yes, so king. Then proclaim this. War with Arthur. Killing to be done against those who deserted us and went to France. War and killing. Killing and war. No peace till Arthur is dead. Look down there, Sir Bedeville. Look how sadly burn the fires of mine enemy, Mordred. Like blood in the night. He met me on the sands of Dover and fled before my knights. And left 2,000 dead. Of his and 2,000 good men of mine. Oh, sad night. Oh, tortured night of red moon and war fires and enemies. Eve of death. And dying to be done again tomorrow. Noble king. Go from me. Take your tears from me, sweet knight. Sleep. For tomorrow, I go. Mm. 
eve of death. Dim, weird night and the sudden shock of dismal thoughts. How was it when there was peace in Camelot? When there was golden youth and flood of laughter? Now how old appear the young faces. Ghosts, all of them. Where the good fellowship, the darts of joy. Ghosts. Ghosts dead. And where is Gawain? Noble Gawain. Where your counsel now, Gawain? The earth of France drank deep your blood. Now you a ghost too. Gawain. Friend Gawain, noble friend, where are your counsel now? I hear madness on the wind. The grief for Gawain drives me mad. Ghost. Ghost of Gawain. List to me. Disperse your forces. What? Do not fight tomorrow. For if you do, Mordred will kill you. How kill me? The sniveller of a night, the chicken of a night. He, the traitor and usurper. Do not fight on the morrow, for Mordred will surely kill you. Make truth. Do not die. Do not die. That's a truly unnerving experience. A voice on the wind, a dead man's voice telling you you'll die tomorrow. That kind of a thing gives pause. You'd want to take your time about what you're going to do come sun up. Now, Arthur was a mighty king and a great warrior, and he'd killed more people by lance and mace and hot oil than you'd ever imagine, but he was also a human being. Voices on the wind shook him up. Ghosts jangled him. Oh, with night. Oh, God ghostly wind, you see. Then... Better be here. Better be here. He needed to tell somebody. This night I heard the ghost voice of Gawain. He bade me not do battle tomorrow, else I will die. So go to the camp of Modred and say I wish to speak truce with him tomorrow. And no sword will be drawn from its scabbard during this talk of truth, Arthur. No sword shall be drawn, Mordred. You pursue me, Arthur, yet I have beaten you. How? I want no more dying. (laughs) Arthur of the sword. Arthur of Excalibur. Truce and no more dying. And what will you give for it? Your life. Oh, and more. What more? Cornwall and Kent while you are alive, and all of Britain when you are dead. Cornwall will be yours, and Kent, and... (laughs) Beware. You draw a sword. That adder at your feet, that crawling thing. I slid it. It was about to attack your foot. You drew a sword. The adder... You see it. You drew a sword. There is no truce, Arthur. True. No truce with such as you. I return to my camp and bid my knights make ready for battle. And then it I swear to you, you die. I swear to you, I will kill you. 
I swear to you. It was a great battle, and history tells us that every man who died was a hero. And many died, and the field was damp with blood. And on the fourth day, those who were still alive crept away to be alone with their wounds and their anguish. And the field was empty. But for two horsemen. How about you, Modred? At you, Sir King! <laughs> You shall not now escape, traitor. Your death has come, Arthur. Your fault. Die. Oh. Die, O oh infamous knight. Oh. Look down, Gawain. You were wrong. Oh. Mordred is... I... Vile knight. You have slain. That's what Mordred did. He slew Arthur. Of course, Mordred died while he was doing it, but he did it. One more thing I'd like to report to you. What Arthur said while breathing his last. I could have found a woman as good as Guinevere, but such a fellowship of knights as was mine can never be brought together again. So, that was the end of King Arthur. Guinevere and Lancelot lived for quite a while after that. just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Triangle on the Round Table, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from accounts and legends by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, William Conrad was heard as King Arthur and Ben Wright as Mordred. Featured in the cast were Ellen Morgan, Lamont Johnson, William John Stone, Edgar Barrier, and Bob Cole. Bob Lamont speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, England in 1827, and the road from Polstead to London. And a bloody road it turned out to be. My report to you will be on The Killing Story of William Corder and The Farmer's Daughter. Thank you. Good night. Imperfect minor details mar a perfect crime on gangbusters this Saturday night. Past Perfect tells the story of ingenious cross-country identity ruse involving a Halloween souvenir and two would-be bandits with the law. It's another true crime case history dramatized by gangbusters on most of these same CBS radio stations this Saturday night. When there's gun smoke... There's Western Adventures, Saturday night, on the CBS Radio Network.